Uh, two tidbits before the sermon starts. Number one, the list on the table is for the, uh, those who wish to attend the Night to be Much Remembered here at the, the hall, actually, in there, um, for the Night to be Much Remembered. That's not for the list for those who are at a, other people's homes or gathering together for that, just for those who will be here. So that's clarification. Also, just informed that um, a few extra copies of the announcements have been made. In case you didn't get a copy, you can get one after services. Uh, just check back by the, uh, the sound booth. They probably have them there on top of a table. All right. How many of you have ever watched the movie Princess Bride? Oh, my. Really? Put your hands back up again. Okay. Now, the rest of you, make a note of this. It's a really, really funny movie. You just got to see it. Um, it, it was, it's, it's not a recent one either. It goes back from the 80s, I think. Um, but it's, uh, it, there's a scene in The Princess Bride that I, I always enjoy. There's this bad guy who is a Cilician uh, from Sicily. And uh, his business is assassination and kidnapping and all that kind of bad stuff. And the hero is chasing him down. And uh, he hired a Spaniard, this, uh, the Italian did. He hired a Spaniard and a giant. And this is back when Andre the Giant was still alive, still quite well, and he played the giant. <laughs> and if you know who Andre the Giant was, he was a Frenchman who uh, was, oh, he was seven feet something tall, huge guy. So he, could, he didn't have to stretch to play a giant by any means. Well, there's a funny scene in it when one of the lead characters, a Spaniard, gets separated from his giant friend and also from his boss, the uh, the the Vicini guy from Sicily, and he remembers that he was told that if they got separated, he should go back to the beginning. And there's a scene toward the latter part of the movie where he says, I'm, I went back to the beginning, being a drunk at a certain tavern and fighting all the time, which is where the giant found him, and then they went to rescue the, the, the boss, the new boss, the, the hero of the film. And it's a great film. It's, it's kind of a fairy tale kind of story of... Uh, Good guys against the bad guys, and the good guys win. But uh, uh, you had to go back to the beginning. That's, that's the lesson from the scene. In our history, that has also been an important lesson. When we want to understand what's happening in the world, go back to the beginning. You know, go back to the Garden of Eden. Go back to the two trees, you know, for the human experience. After God had gotten, gotten it to the time of Adam and Eve, you go back to that because it was at that time that human history, because that's when the first humans were, that's when human history began and has led to where we are now. And, of course, God has a plan for, for us going forward. But to understand it, we have to go back to the beginning, and we've, we've often done that. We did that actually recently, going back to the history of the true trees in the Garden of Eden. But when you want to understand anything, you really need to go back to the beginning. Where did it start and how did it, how did it get going? And when it comes to looking at the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, as a, as a combined, there are two festivals there. The Passover, of course, is, and the Days of Unleavened Bread are. But they're connected, directly connected. Uh, and if you want to understand them, you have to go back to the beginning. Go back to when the Passover was first instituted, in other words. To understand and appreciate the Passover of Christ, you have to know why it was called a Passover. And that's what we're going to do today. The title of the sermon is simply Prelude to Passover. We're going to go back and draw some lessons and review the events that established the Passover of the Exodus that, is, that gave its name to the Passover sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So by understanding the first part, we'll appreciate the second part, that which came later, that much better. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as our introduction to the topic. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because here the Apostle Paul illustrates the point of taking us back to the beginning of the, past, the, the history of the Passover, that is. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We want to look uh, starting right at the uh, first part of, the, of verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. 
They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and they all ate the same spiritual food, and they drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So the Lord God that led the Israelites out of Egypt, using Moses as his servant, was actually Christ working, working with, with Israel. Now go back and you realize we're baptized into Moses. Now, those of us who have repented and, and uh, you know, accepted Christ as our personal Savior and ultimately been baptized, and when we say baptized in God's church, we mean by immersion because sprinkling doesn't count. Baptizo means to immerse in Greek. It's very clear. And that's essentially what happened to the entire nation of Israel, such as it was at that time. When we get into the history of how many Israelites were, there were, we're talking about a population approximately the size of Cincinnati, three million or so, uh, just a little, perhaps a little over three million. But we'll get to that here in, in a few minutes. But when they crossed in the Red Sea, is it, well, hold it, they had water to the left of them, they had water to the right of them, tall walls of Red Sea water. There, when you look on a map, you'll see that the Red Sea comes up along the side of Africa uh, and uh, Arabia, and then it branches, and it goes around sort of a V-shaped landmass, which is, Mount, is the Sinai Peninsula. And the, the Gulf of Suez, that part of the Red Sea, goes up to Egypt. And you think, wow, they named it after the canal. No, no, the canal's named after the Gulf. That's why it's called the Suez Canal. But then the other branch goes up toward Israel itself, up to the southern tip of it, and that's called the Gulf of Aqaba. Both are branches of the Red Sea, the two tongues of the Red Sea at the top of it. Where they crossed the, uh, the Red Sea was in the Gulf of Suez. Uh, there, there have been researchers that try to argue, no, 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 they went all the way across the Sinai Peninsula and crossed the other, other way. And, you know, they make all their arguments and they found chariot wheels in the Gulf of Aqaba. But don't forget, there have been a lot of shipwrecks from the ancient times, and a lot of them had chariot wheels on them, so that's not proof enough positive. Uh, in fact, Jehoshaphat lost an entire fleet in the Gulf of Aqaba. And undoubtedly, it had chariots on it as well. That's back in... in, in uh, in the book of Kings and also in Chronicles. So we have uh, the Gulf of Suez it would work. The reason that the other researchers, uh, I think they were based out of Kentucky initially, thought it was the Gulf of Aqaba is because, well, nobody else thought of that. So they went and found mountains in Arabia that had looked like they had fire scorched mountains and so on and so forth. The problem is to move about three million people on foot with their livestock to the Gulf of Aqaba and cross it on the last day of unleavened bread is impossible, let alone crossing it on the first day of unleavened bread. But it was the last day of unleavened bread when the crossing took place. You can't get there from here. It would have taken about a month of hard marching to get that many people across the Sinai Peninsula. There's a, there's a route. It's, it was a, a caravan route that they could have taken, but they would have still, would, the, the distance was too much. Yeah, they crossed, crossed the Gulf of Suez. God led them with the, the pillar of fire at night, cloud in the daytime. He led them down and deliberately had them tangled up in the mountains at the top end of the Gulf of Suez. So when they went across, they went over the Suez. That's where the Egyptians caught up with them. That's where the Egyptian army or the, the chariot force, the strike force of the Egyptian army was wiped out. But it was a symbolic baptism for ancient Israel. Because they were surrounded by water to the left, water to the right, and they were in the bottom of the, of the, uh, the sea floor. And they were going over dry shod because God had dried it out with the wind. But where was the water above them to be immersed? That was the cloud, Christ's presence, or uh, the name that he, we know him now by is Jesus Christ, the Lord God. He was in the cloud. That was his presence was there. So the cloud was on top of them. So they were surrounded by water. It made a symbolic baptism. Water vapor in the cloud is the, is the point. They all ate the same spiritual drink, and they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. It wasn't yet known as Christ, but he had, has other names. Even as a father, has other names, but all reflecting the divine Godhead. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. 
Now, all these things, and here we go with our, our key point that we're looking at, the prelude to Passover, all these things in verse 6 happened to them for as for, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after things as they do, or as they also lusted, or become idolaters as some of them did. And when you read the, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, uh, starting you know, with Exodus and on into uh, Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy have the events. Leviticus has more to do with the uh, specific responsibilities of the tribe of Levi as the priest. But where you have the listing of events, the Israelites got themselves into no end of trouble during those 40 years of wandering. And so we know about that ahead of time so that we don't make the same mistakes. And he goes on to say, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. And that was when they, uh, Moses had gone up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments and was up there a long time. And so they decided that he wasn't coming back, and he made a, a golden calf. And they rose up to play, which would be a sex orgy. That's the way you worshipped pagan idols, by the way. It was all sex-oriented. And that's why paganism was so popular back in the day. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And one day 23,000 fell, nor, uh, nor tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as examples. So we're getting this repeated. And they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we can now go back and look at some of those events, walk through sort of a survey of what transpired leading up to the Exodus. We'll get in, of course, in the course of the Holy Days, we'll look at some of the lessons of what happened in the wandering years, we always do, and in often the sermons, sermonettes afterwards. But let's go now back to uh, Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Here we have the events of the life of Moses, the Israelites moving into Egypt. How did they get there in the first place so that they ended up as slaves, so that they ended up needing to be freed and taken out, uh, out of Egypt? Now, I think we know the story. If we stop and think about it, we, we know how they got into Egypt. Joseph was betrayed and sold by his brothers. Uh, some of them wanted to kill him, but one of them wanted to make a profit, so he sold him as a slave to the Egyptians. And then they went and told their father that he died. You know, they lied. And later on, he wasn't, you know, he made it down into Egypt and he ended up being a slave. And we know his story of being thrown in prison unjustly and so on. Uh, incredible story of Joseph. Ultimately being freed after he had been shown the interpretation of a vision that the Pharaoh had about the seven good years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And he prepared during the good years for the seven bad years. And how Pharaoh made him essentially his prime minister to oversee all of that. I mean, it's a phenomenal story to read the life of Joseph. And the Egyptians highly regarded the Israelites. So we begin in chapter 1 of Exodus. These are the names of the children of Israel who came into Egypt. Each one of his household came with Jacob. Reuben and Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And all those were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. For Joseph was in Egypt already. And as far as we know at the time, his family numbered four. Ephraim and Manasseh were the two sons, and then Joseph and his wife. And then Joseph died. They settled. Joseph got them settled. They enjoyed the favor of the government of Egypt and the Egyptian people because of Joseph. But eventually, Joseph would come to his end. And he did. So this would be quite a few decades, probably after this event occurred of them coming in. And the children of Israel were fruitful. They increased abundantly and multiplied. They grew exceedingly mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose a king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So we have this transpiring of events that is, if you go back and study Egyptology and its history and, and everything, you think, well, they always had pharaohs, and the pharaohs were always from the same line, and that wasn't actually the case. Egypt was a fairly dynamic nation. It was based on the Nile River. When you look at the map, 
And if you put your map on the wall, the Nile flows uphill, which doesn't make sense because we always think of, we, we place north on the top when we put a map on a wall, so it looks like it's flowing uphill. Actually, the Nile River is one of the few great rivers in the world that flows downhill to the north. Almost all the others flow in another direction. Uh, we have a river that flows north for 150 or more miles, actually a system of rivers that flows north much longer than that. It's the Missouri and the Gallatin and the Jefferson and the Madison, which are the three rivers that form the Missouri River in Montana. And they flow north through Montana from Wyoming, and then they finally decide to make an easterly turn at Fort Benton, Montana. We used to live in Great Falls, and the Great Falls, we, we lived right on the Missouri River at the time. And we, went, we had brethren in Fort Benton, so we you know, followed the flow of the river a lot. Uh, the freeway, Interstate 15, drives, comes right along that north-south section. But as we know, the Missouri feeds on around, and it goes uh, east, and, and then finally starts going southeast. And ultimately, it, it rendezvous with the Mississippi and the Ohio. The Ohio has already joined the Mississippi. And then it flows south. Now, one of the greatest river systems the world has ever seen is the Ohio, Missouri, Mississippi system. It's one of the reasons why the center of the country could be settled so effectively and so rapidly because you could send things down the river and get them out to the ocean. You know, trade uh, could prosper. Most countries don't have that. Russia, on the other hand, has many rivers, actually quite a few large-ish ones, ish ones, large-ish, not really large, they're shallow, that flow north into the Arctic Sea. That doesn't help because you can't sail in the Arctic Sea most of the time. And some of the time you can't sail in it at all. Um, because of the, uh, uh, of the winter. So the blessing of having a southerly or easterly or westerly rivers makes them tr navigable for America and for lots of other countries. Russia was not blessed with many rivers flowing in the right direction. It's just God decided to place them there for that particular reason. That geography has always been in God's hands. But the Nile is the one river, the one major river, that flows almost totally north. When you go down on the map today and you get to the south edge of Egypt and into the Sudan, which is the country below Egypt, but in ancient times it would have simply been an extension of Egypt. It flowed back and forth uh, between upper and lower Egypt. You have the Blue Nile and the White Nile that come together to form the Nile. And those go off up into the mountains of clear down into Ethiopia and a little bit into the central Africa for one of the branches of the Nile. The Egyptian Egyptians, the ones that we read about most of the time, were what they called in Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt was downriver. Upper Egypt was upriver. So there were times when you had the, the darker African tribes of Egyptians that dominated. They would be the pharaohs of Upper Egypt because they were from down toward the Sudan. And then you had the other times when the more Arabic looking Egyptians, and by the way, most of the Egyptians today are Arabic, they aren't Egyptians at all. They came in with the conquest of Islam. Uh, but they would have been called Lower Egypt. Just to give you a little overview of, of Egypt before we, we go on. And therefore, their, their dynasties changed from time to time, and that's part of the reason. It was upper or lower, and then, and then there was a group, the Hyksos, that came in from someplace other than Egypt and conquered Egypt, and then they ruled it for a significant period of time, including part of the time while the Israelites were there. So this gives us a little background on it. We are going now to uh, look at the Egyptians. The Israelites are in Egypt. But things are about to change. A new pharaoh arose who did not know or care about Joseph. Uh, the Israelites uh, populated quickly, became a latent threat to the Egyptians because they were so fertile. They had lots of kids, and that was beginning to be a political issue for them. This was probably during the Hyksos period, H-Y-K-S-O-S, -S, Hyksos, uh, which would have been an outer... H-Y-K-O-S, outside of Egypt, a group that moved in and, and had an entire dynasty for a period of time, approximately 200 years, uh, not, maybe not quite that much, maybe a little bit more, 750 B.C. to 1570 B.C. 
Uh, and then it went back to the Egyptians. So they didn't recognize Joseph when they came in. Some other pharaoh came up. Joseph meant nothing to them. If it was an invading dynasty, that would be the classic reason why they wouldn't make any difference to them who Joseph had been. Therefore, the Egyptians, were, or the Israelites within Egypt, were simply looked as a problem, and uh, so they had to deal with them. So the new king, verse 8 of chapter 1 of Exodus, came in. He didn't know Joseph. And he said to the people, of, look, the people of Israel are more and mightier than we, in verse 9. Let's deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. So they made them into a labor force, slaves, in other words, a slave people. And they set taskmasters over them. But that didn't slow them down. They kept growing, and, and their population was getting larger and larger, and they were strong and healthy people. So they made a plan. This was more nefarious in verse 15. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom uh, the name of one was uh, Shipra, or Shifra, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, you have to do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew woman and see them at the birth stools. If it is a son, you shall kill him. If, it, if it's a daughter, you let her live. And in that way, they would weaken the growth of the Israelites. The daughters would live. They would eventually start marrying outside of, each of the Israelite numbers, and then they would dissipate and not be a threat. However, the midwives were Hebrews. They were Jews. They were Israelites, too, so they didn't kill the baby boys. Uh, they, they saved the children, the male children, alive. So then the, the Pharaoh came up with another plan. He said, all right, well, this is what's going to happen. Every male baby of the Hebrews is thrown into the Nile and let him drown. And that became the new law, as the midwives had protected the Israelites. Now we come to chapter 2. And a man of the house of Levi went and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And this would be the uh, marriage of Amram. And uh, these are the parents of Moses and Aaron and Miriam. So the woman conceived and she bore a son. And she saw that he was a beautiful child. She hid him for three months. But when she couldn't hide him any longer, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, or made an ark of bulrushes for him, and dabbed it with asphalt and pitch. In other words, waterproofed it, a, a little boat that he would float in. And she didn't pitch him into the, uh, just anywhere into the Nile. She laid it in the reeds by the Nile's edge, and her si his sister, which would be Miriam, she was older than Moses, stood afar off to know what would be done to him. She followed along, watching this little ark. They didn't just set it adrift. It would appear that they set it adrift just upstream from where the Pharaoh's daughter had her bathing center at the edge of the Nile River. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe in the river, and her maidens went along the riverside, and she saw the ark and the reeds and sent a maid to get it. And when she opened it, there was a child, a little baby, and it was crying. So she, she had compassion upon him. This is still verse 6. And said, so this is one of the Hebrew children. So his sister, you know, Miriam, suddenly shows up. Oh, would you like me to get a nursemaid for him? And the Pharaoh's daughter said yes. So she did that, and she took him back to his mother. And so Moses' mother then nursed the baby until he was old enough to be brought to Pharaoh, to Pharaoh's daughter, rather, and he became her son. She adopted him. Now, adoption of children was not uncommon in the ancient world. That far ancient, or even more, more recent in, you know, ancient to us, even up into the Middle Ages, adopting children was not uncommon at all. In fact, the Romans, and later the Celts, and various other countries did it. They would have a king would adopt the son of a rival king. And that king would adopt his son or daughter. So you had adopted children go growing up in your enemy's family, ruling family? Why would they do that? Well, you're not going to make war against that kingdom if your child is at risk. And likewise, they're not likely to make war against you if that king's child is at risk. So adoption was not uncommon. That was one of the reasons. And in this case, you know, Pharaoh's daughter apparently didn't have any kids. So she wanted a child and she adopted Moses. Now, and it came to pass when Moses was grown, he went out among his brethren. There is a jump between 10, verse 10 and 11 of about 40 years. So there's a, all that time, the 40-year jump there, when Moses 
is uh, because he goes out and he kills an Egyptian taskmaster, and then he has to go on the lamp, as they used to say back in the 30s. He had to uh, escape from the authorities, and he escaped a long ways. But getting back to uh, the intervening 40 years, he grew up. If he was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter, he would have had an Egyptian education in all the fine arts of the Egyptians, the knowledge of the Egyptians, whether their history, their whatever mathematics they knew, on top of what he would have gotten from the Israelites, who would have also had mathematics and capabilities. And it's pretty much evident that they were being used as slaves to build the treasure cities, uh, that some of them were engineers that managed the building projects. They weren't just the labor force that did it. There was, there was a lot of skill involved. Moses would have learned all of those things. He would have had a phenomenal education. We know for a fact that he did because Stephen knew that back in Acts chapter 8. If you hold your place in Exodus, we'll look briefly in Acts, Acts 7. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 7. Stephen, if you'll remember, was one of the first deacons ordained in chapter 6 of Acts in the New Testament church. He was one of the first seven deacons. Um, he and Philip, who was another one of the deacons, ended up had, you know, in the preaching ministry of the church. At the time, Philip's career lasted much longer than Stephen's because in chapter 7, Stephen was executed for preaching essentially a sermon um, to a synagogue uh, in, Israel, in Judea. And in that synagogue, there was one man called Saul, who was, in, who was a very prominent young man in the leadership of the synagogue. And that Saul became the Apostle Paul. But before he was converted, he was a fire-breathing monster to the church. And he was responsible for the execution or the martyrdom of Stephen. But notice uh, verse 22, in the midst of Stephen's dissertation, here to this, uh, this Jewish synagogue, he makes a comment about Moses. Um, in verse 17, but the time of the promise drew near which God had sworn to Abraham and the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another king arose who did not know Joseph and this man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers, making them expose their babies so they might not live. And at this time, Moses was born and was well pleasing in, to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And then verse 22. And Moses was learned, or learned, as we might say it, in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deed. And when he was 40 years old, it came to his heart to visit his brethren. So it was during that 40 years of his growing up and you know, becoming a man and a leader in the nation that we then have to go to outside history to find out what Stephen was referring to. But Josephus is a Jewish historian from, oh, about 132 A.D., or 130s A.D. is when he did most of his writing. And Josephus says that, among other things, Moses was a great general of the Egyptian army and that he subdued the Ethiopians, meaning that he, on behalf of the lower Egypt, he attacked upper Egypt because they, they fought wars back and forth regularly, and he subdued Ethiopia. And it says later, we find out that he married an Ethiopian woman, probably happened at that time. Uh, but whatever the case, Moses had been very accomplished in Egypt. He would have, as a prince of the nation, had the finest education. And he was a man of great deeds. That was just one of the ones that we know about from, from history is that uh, he conquered the Egyptian army and made it a part of greater Egypt again. You know, they, they went back and forth. Sometimes upper Egypt rules lower Egypt. So then he comes along and he, may, he kills the Egyptian and decides to uh, do something on behalf of his Hebrew brethren because he knows good and well who he is. Even Charlton Heston knew who he was in the movie, uh, The Ten Commandments. And he goes out the next day and tries to break up a fight between two Israelites. And they said, who makes you a judge between us? Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And that was there in verse 14 of Acts 2, and, uh, or rather Exodus 2. And then Moses realizes that he, his deed of killing the taskmaster is well known. 
and he finds wanted posters all over the place, or the equivalent thereof, with his name and face on them, so he decides it's time to exit stage left, and he leaves Egypt. He goes across probably the way of, uh, the, way of the king, the, the caravan route, straight across the Sinai Peninsula, which would have led him into the territory of Midian. The Midianites primarily were in Arabia, across the Gulf of Aqaba, but they came up and over the Gulf of Aqaba into where the, the southern tip of Israel and Jordan are today. Um, they, they could have gone by land, they could have come across that Gulf itself by boat, but probably with flocks and herds they would go up and around the upper end. So they had holdings in the Sinai, in the eastern Sinai Peninsula, and in that northwest corner of Arabia was the territory of Midian. So he ended up in the territory of Midian, probably on the, uh, the Arabian side of the Gulf. Uh, we're guessing deep into Midian, in other words. And he sat down by a well, and a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs with uh, water of their father's flock. But then there were other shepherds who would come and chase off the girls uh, because they had no bigger brothers to defend them. Well, Moses took on the role of the big brother. And, and uh, it, just like in the movie, he probably pretty well thrashed the other uh, shepherds. So they backed off and the girls got their flocks watered early and they got home. And they took Moses with them to meet their father, Ruel, in verse 18. Ruel has another name. He had two names by which he was known. Uh, and the other one was Jethro. So Ruel and Jethro were the same person. The father of Zipporah, who was Moses' wife, ultimately. They explain the situation. He invites Moses to, you know, to settle with them. He marries Zipporah, which means bird. And uh, then they had a little son named Gershom. And Moses became a sheep rancher for 40 years. Now, we're leading up to the Exodus, but it's good to know this background and to be reminded of it from time to time. And Moses had part of his life as a reasonably mundane working life. Part of it was more exciting, I suppose, if you could like, like uh, downtown uh, Cairo or whatever it was called back in those days. And, but the rest of his life was out in the sheep ranches of Midian. And you think, well, how could they keep sheep on the desert of the Sinai Peninsula? Today, it's, mostly, it's pretty deserty. It's just an awful lot of sand and not very much grass at all. And so is Arabia, right across the Gulf of Aqaba. It wasn't like that then. Under those sands in Arabia are the ruins of many cities. And back in the day, there would have, this would have, you probably have been more like grasslands rather than sandy deserts. You know, because, because something looks like it looks now doesn't mean it looked like that then. Now, for various reasons, climate change, you know, all the cow burps that can cause global warming, which then causes global cooling and, you know, all the crazy things that our so-called scientists come up with these days. But climate change did happen. God normally was turning up or down the, the thermometer of the planet. And he made it happen for particular reasons. He moved people around with changing local climates here and there. But when you think about how when we get to, the, again, the number of the Israelites leaving and taking all their livestock with them, and you've got about 3.5 million people, how much livestock are you going to have to support 3.5 million people? That's their livelihood. That's their milk. That's their meat. Uh, that's their wealth. They would have not been able to wander in the Sinai Peninsula on a, on a sandy desert. They had to have grasslands. They had manna to feed the people. It doesn't say they fed the cattle with manna. So they would have had grasslands for the, for the, the people. It would be like going through the great prairies of, early, of uh, earlier in America in the 1800s. It would, would be probably a better comparison. So, where were we? Oh, yes. So Moses was content to live there, and it happened, though, in verse 23. It happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, the one that had put the wanted posters up. And the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. You know, they went from one, one bad pharaoh to another bad pharaoh. And they cried out, and their, their cry came up to God because of the bondage. He heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. 
you know, in a way, because we, we look at this and we know there are lessons that we can draw from the history. In a way, we were groaning. We were beginning to see trouble in our lives. And this is part of how God called us. He allowed us to see things like that. And we were looking for a way out of the trouble, out of the spiritual bondage we found ourselves in as God began to open our minds to understand his truth, leading us ultimately to be a part of his church in this age, spiritual Israelites, whereas this was physical Israelites back then. Now, granted, there are plenty of modern, modern church members who are, are physical Israelites as well as being spiritual Israelites, but the, the most important aspect is this being spiritual Israel. So he then begins to intervene in Moses' life. Now we're in chapter 3, Moses tending a flock of Jethro. See, now Ruel and Jethro, again, uh, they're the same man, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock uh, to the back of the desert, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The back of the desert then for the Midianites would have been on the Sinai, because that's where Sinai, uh, the Mount Horeb was, or Mount Sinai. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of a bush. So this is the burning bush incident. Now Moses' life has slowed down. He had had a high speed, and if you can call chariots high speed, he had a high speed life until he had to run in with the taskmaster and sort of took the law into his own hands. And then he was a wanted man, a fugitive. So he beat the street went clear across the Sinai, all probably into uh, the Arabian side, and that's where he spent a lot of time. But his grazing work took him back around in the Sinai, and so here he is in the, the territory of the Sinai Peninsula. And he sees this, this bush that was burning with fire, but the bush wasn't consumed. So he says, I think I'll go look at that. And he did. And when, he, when God saw that he turned aside to look in verse 4 of chapter 3, he, he called to him from the bush. He said, Moses, Moses. And there's a reasonable facsimile, you know, in a film, at least, in the Ten Commandments for this scene, which, you know, we can kind of see in our mind's eye. And Moses said, well, here I am. And he said, do not come near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place you stand on is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He was afraid. And God said, I, will sure, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows, though I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up to a good, out of that land to a good and large land. Notice the description of the promised land. A good and large land to a land flowing with milk and honey. And when you go and you look, even today, at the southern part of the promised land, it doesn't look like that. It looks like it's desert that's gradually being reclaimed, which is what it is. And so you can't think back to the time of the Israelites coming into Egypt, or even further forward to the time of David, which would be, oh, let me think, centuries, centuries later for King David, about a 1,000 uh, BC, where we're still in the 1400s BC, 400 years later, it was flowing with milk and honey then too. It wasn't a barren desert with a stock of grass here and a stock of grass there. It was a rich land. It could hold a large population of people. And it flowed with milk, meaning that there was, you know, food to provide a lot of milk from the, from the, both the uh, cows, milk cows and milk goats, and milk camels, not that you drank camel milk, but you baby camels loved it. And honey, so there were a lot of bees, a lot of flowers, a lot of vegetation. And then it tells all the ice that lived there, and they were going to have to leave because of the sins of the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and so on. So God says, I'm going to deliver the Israelites, and you're going to help me. And that was the part that Moses balked at. In verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And God said, I will certainly be with you and be a sign to you. You shall be a sign to you that you, when you have brought the people out of the land of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. So they would come back there, which they did, of course, and that's where the Ten Commandments were delivered. And Moses said, well, who am I going to say sent me? And then we come to 
uh, verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's my name. That's what you'll say. The self-existent one, which is what the, the YHVH or tetragrammaton, the four-letter name of God that uh, is in Egypt, in, written in Hebrew. And you wonder, well, why is it only four letters? It's because the, in ancient Hebrew, they didn't write the vowels. They just wrote consonants. And if you sat down and wrote a letter to somebody today and you left all the vowels out of your letters, they would probably be able to pretty well guess what you were trying to say. But 100 years from now, as languages sort of morph and change, it would be difficult to come back and find that email that you wrote just in consonants and be able to translate it accurately. But whatever the case, that was the name that God revealed it. And he goes on to explain, Brown in verse 19, however, I am sure that the king of Egypt won't let you go. You're going to, release, you're going to free the, Egypt, the Israelites, but they're not going to let you go. Not by a mighty, not even with a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and smack him good. I will strike Egypt with my wonders, which I will do in its midst. And after that, he'll let you go. So he explains the entire game plan to Moses. And you think, well, with the game plan in place and the fact that Moses had been a leader of armies and highly educated and capable man, he would have been willing to go and do that. But I think he liked the sheep herding a lot more than he liked the, hit, the hectic life earlier because he starts making excuses in chapter 4. But suppose, verse 1, but suppose they won't believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord didn't appear to you. And then God goes through the serpent and the rod. So he says, what's that in your hand? He says, it's a rod. He said, throw it in the ground. Suddenly it's a big snake. Now, presumably a poisonous snake. And he said, now pick up, pick it up by the tail. Picks it by the tail. It's his rod again. He said, now stick your hand in your pocket, in your coat pocket. Sticks his hand inside his coat pocket. Pull it out. It's covered with leprosy, which is a death sentence in the ancient world. They didn't know how to deal with it. You stick it back in again. Pull it out again. It was healthy. He said, I can do that, Moses. You'll be able to deliver Egypt. But it, even with that, Moses was hesitant. And Moses said to the Lord in verse 10, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent. I didn't graduate from spokesman's club back in the day. Neither before us nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And you, you wonder, was he really slow of speech and tongue when he was uh, in the midst of his Egyptian education and in his car early career years and leading an army down in, in Ethiopia, according to Josephus, and things like that? Well, maybe he was. There are some generals that uh, were not what you call public speakers, but most of them are capable of doing that. But after being a sheep rancher for 40 more years, and he was now 80, not 80 like us. When we're 80, we, we're running a lot slower. Moses was 80 and still pretty healthy because he was still running fast at 120 when he died because he had to die because he couldn't go into the promised land. But he was hesitant. He didn't want to have to go and talk to Pharaoh or anybody, really. And so God says in verse 11, Who made man's mouth? Or who made the mute, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the eternal? Now therefore go, and I'll be with your mouth, and I'll teach you what you'll say. And then, did that convince Moses? See, pretty soon we begin to identify with Moses quite a lot. Uh, the, early, the early Moses. Oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of, whomever, by the hand of whomever else you may send. <laughs> Anybody but me. And God was getting a little short-tempered with him. He said, all right. Is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. Because you've got to remember, God knows everything. I know he can speak well. What you do is you tell him what to say, and he'll say it for you. And we'll do it that way. So Moses returned to his father-in-law. He was more or less convinced and agreed to go. And he took the rod and proceeded on his way. Uh, and uh, ultimately rendezvoused with Aaron, and they became the team that, that we know of. Let's move forward now to chapter 5. We're going to try to get all the way through to chapter 12 here. 
Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, this was their first audience with Pharaoh, because he and Aaron discussed it in chapter 4. They discussed what they needed to do. And so they had their first audience with the king of Egypt. And um, they went in and said, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, nor will I let them go. He said, the God of the Hebrews met with us. This is what Moses tells Aaron and Aaron tells Pharaoh. Please let us go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or a sword. And the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Bear in mind, the Israelites are slaves. They're building the treasure cities. Now, a lot of the treasure city required mental work, so you had the intelligent and highly educated ones doing that, but the rest of it was grunt work, which the rank and file of Egypt, was, or Egypt or, sorry, the Israelites were having to do. Let us go three days' journey, and, and he said, no, you guys, you're interfering with their work. You go back to your labor. And he said, then he told his other lieutenants, the Pharaoh did, the people are, they're not having to work hard enough. So this is what the plan is. They make the bricks for the construction, these mud bricks. And we've been providing the straw to mix with the mud. We're not going to do that anymore. They can get their own straw, and they can keep making just as many bricks. And that's, of course, the scene in, uh, also in the Ten Commandments. They, they pick that as, to make it into a scene, and that's what happened. And then Moses returned to the Lord and said in verse 22, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. Like it was going to be boom, boom, boom. Now Moses, 80 years old, supposed to have measure of wisdom, supposed to have some ability and confidence and, you know, maturity of thinking. You read this and you realize, you know, he's kind of like us, <laughs> a little insecure, uh, not sure, not too confident, you know, trying to have faith, but, but worried about it. And so God props him up in chapter six, said to Moses, now you shall see what I'll do to Pharaoh for with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he'll drive them out of his land. And God said to Moses, Again, in verse 2, I am the eternal. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, eternal, or the YHVH, we pronounce it Yahweh, but we don't know what the vowels are. See, we know what the consonants are. We don't know what the vowels are for that, because at one point, the Jews stopped writing the, the, the name of God. They didn't, then they only wrote in consonants anyway. So we, we know what the consonants were, but we don't know what the vowels were. Those were handed down by oral tradition. Parents would teach their children, grandparents their grandchildren. And if, several hundred years before Christ's first coming, they stopped pronouncing that name because it was too sacred, apparently. But it only takes two generations, and nobody has a clue how it was pronounced and what vowels went in there. So when we say it's Yahweh or Yahweh or Yowo, who knows? We don't know what the vowels were. So people who say that it's, they, they know what it is, they don't know what it is. It's the YHVH, or the four-letter word of God's name. And the fancy-dancy way of saying the four-letter word is the tetra, meaning four, grammaton letters. Tetragrammaton, the four letters. I think that's Latin, but don't quote me on that. Um, the tetragrammaton word. God goes on to explain, I'll make my covenant with them. I'm going to intervene on their behalf. I'm going to take them out of here, and you're going to help me, Moses. He goes through the whole line again, re-explaining re to Moses, you know, reassuring him. In verse 12, though Moses spoke before the Lord, the children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. In other words, I don't know how to talk well. I'm terrified of giving speeches, especially in front of Pharaoh. And uh, God said, don't worry, that's going to be Aaron that's going to be doing the talking for now. Then we have a section in chapter 6 that is the genealogy of Moses and Aaron. That starts in verse 14. And uh, 
goes all the way down to verse 27, explaining their, basically their genealogies. And that's important. In, you, know, you come to a genealogy in the Bible, and a lot of people fall asleep when they're trying to read through the Bible. Oh, a genealogy. Why did God inspire all these genealogies? And you think, this is bad. Go to, go to Chronicles, First Chronicles especially. Why are those there? You don't have to read them for word for word when you're just reading through the Bible. You can skip those sections if you want to. But when you're doing the historical studies of Scripture, they're fascinating. It's like going to findagrave.com when you're tracking your own ancestors back. And then you study genealogies. Well, then you can see the value of them. They're valuable for identifying who the tribes are in the modern era, where they went down through history. They're actually very valuable in tracking the tribes of Israel through history. But for learning the spiritual lessons of Scripture, initially you can skip over those and don't worry about it. And then go back and look at them for specialized uh, Bible study sometime. And we come down to verse 28. It came to pass on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt that the Lord spoke to him, saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. And then he repeats the uncircumcised lips. Why would Pharaoh listen to me? And then God explains the game plan again. How many times does he have to sort of explain the game plan to us today? But he does. He said, see... I have made you, this is chapter one, 7, verse 1, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. As you go in and you don't say much, Aaron asks you what to say, and then he says it. So it's, it's like me speaking to you, and you're speaking to, to Aaron. And you're the big bad guy in Pharaoh's mind because you're the main instigator, and he knows Aaron is simply your mouthpiece. So God goes through it all again. He has to do this several times to bolster the energy of Moses. Now, when Moses gets going, you know, it's like one of those Model Ts back in the hand crank days. I never got to crank one of those, but we did have John Deere tractors that were, didn't have electric starters. They had a flywheel you had to spin. And, you know, here I'm barely a teenager, and we had to spin these things to get the tractor started every time we started the tractor, except when we parked it on a hill. Then we could coast down the hill provided the brakes were working well. Otherwise, you couldn't park it on the hill. <laughs> it would roll down there all by itself otherwise. So this, this is the, the hand cranking is getting Moses up and going here. Um, in verse 8, Moses spoke, or Lord spoke to Moses and, and now said, Now, when Pharaoh speaks to you, show a miracle for yourselves, and you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh. And so this is what happened. They had the incident of throwing down the, uh, the rod of Aaron, which became the snake, and then the magicians of Egypt threw down their rods, and they became snakes. You know, so what? We can do that too. They had trained snakes. And then the snake that became, we had been the rod of Aaron, ate their snakes. And then Aaron picked his snake back up, and it became a rod, and they didn't have any more rods. So they, they, you know, how outsmarted themselves. The first plague comes. We know this one well. It's blood. The water is turned to blood, specifically the Nile River and all the standing water in Egypt. So the only way the people could find any water to drink was to dig in the sand next to the Nile where it is leached through the sand and purified to some degree. That's a horrendous thing. The Nile River was a god to the Egyptians. They worshipped the river. That was one of the many things they worshipped. But it was their lifeline. It came down out of Africa, coming down out of the mountains of Abyssinia. And it was a massive river. And every year it flooded. And it would lay down fresh soil. So their crops were phenomenal along the Nile Delta. And, and the Delta and all the way up the river because it flooded all along. It doesn't do that anymore. They have a dam, the High Aswan Dam that they built uh, in the 70s, finished in the 70s anyway. But uh, this was back in the day when it did flood. So that took seven days. You imagine the stench of the river from one end of the country to the other. And the, the Israelites got to smell that, too. They had to dig along the edge of the river to find water to drink, too, because that plague affected them. The Israelites primarily dwelt in the delta. They were up near the Mediterranean 
where the Nile fanned out into the smaller streams that emptied into the Mediterranean. That's where they lived. So they'd have been around, surrounded by the smell and, and the inconvenience of having to dig for some drinking water and for their livestock as well. Um, and of course, it was very helpful of the magicians of Egypt in verse 22 that they also could turn water into blood, or turn it red at least. Then came the second plague in chapter 8. Go to Pharaoh and say, thus said, let my people go. And if they refuse, then I will smite your territory with frogs. Now, frogs are cute. Some people, you know, like to have ceramic frogs. I have one. Um, it's in a milk cup that my mother gave me when I was a little guy. And she said, there's a surprise in your cup. You have to drink your milk. Well, I was like telling a calf to drink milk. I love milk. I swilled it down, and I was all excited when I saw the tip of the frog's nose. He's looking up, you know? And then I drank the rest of it down. It became my favorite cup, but I was only allowed to use it occasionally because I had a tendency to drop things, and it was ceramic. Um, so they, they would have had something similar, except it was a real frog. Mine was a ceramic frog <laughs> that was made into, a, into the cup and drinking their tea, and something gets in their mouth, and they pull out a frog. Ah. Now, granted, it could have been worse. It could have been toads, African toads. And that part of Africa, you know, Egypt and a little bit south, they have toads that can get up to 26 pounds in size. Can you imagine a toad that big? The reason I happen to know about it, I was reading a book on hunting, and it was describing how different tribesmen of, around the world hunted, and so they the tribesmen where these, frog, these toads are found would capture a toad and they have it make a collar for it. And they would get it back in the bushes where the little birds are. And the tongue would go out and instead of snatching a fly, it would snatch a canary or another bird or, of any size that you could get into its mouth and pull it right back in its mouth. Well, it couldn't swallow it because it had a collar on, so they, they would be sitting a little ways from their frog or the toad and they'd go poke it in the, under the chin and it would blurp out this bird and they grab it. That's what they either sold the birds for pets or they ate them. So that's not my kind of hunting, but it's kind of interesting, you know. That's, these were the Nile frogs. These weren't even the great big bullfrogs. These were the frogs that could get everywhere and into everything. They could come under your door and slither and sneak in here and there and hop on stuff and you can just imagine frogs everywhere. And guess what? The Egyptians, magicians, they could make frogs come too. And that helped a lot. Uh, the frogs were taken away after a few days. And what came next? The next plague. And the plagues were designed to soften up the Egyptian pharaoh so that he'd let his people go, God's people go. And it was lice or mites, uh, tiny, tiny insects that... They got on man and beast. This is in uh, verse 16 to 19. Uh, the Egyptian magician said this is the finger of God because they couldn't imitate this one. But Pharaoh hardened his heart even more. So the fourth plague came. That was flies. And these are the, they're not great big house flies like we have. These were smaller flies that like to get around your eyes and around your mouth and the edge of your nose and, and hang on there. And I don't know why. They find stuff there that they like to eat. Um, but that's the kind of fly that, that they were dealing with. Now, the beauty of it was, by the time the fly, the, when the fly plague came, no longer did it affect the Israelites. God made a separation. They had no swarms of flies in the delta region where the Israelites lived. Only where the Egyptians were. That's where the flies were. And so Pharaoh hated the flies and said, you can go. So they got ready to go, and they said, no, you can't go. So then Moses came back with another message. You're going to have another plague. He says, your livestock is going to be plagued. It's a livestock disease that killed a lot of the flocks and herd, cattle, horses, donkeys, camels, and oxen of the Egyptians. Didn't wipe them all out, but it decimated them significantly. However, it didn't affect the livestock of the Israelites at all. And you think, well, why didn't it kill all the livestock of the Egyptians? Well, because we had hail coming. We needed to kill some with that. You know, you drag out the, the, the punishment to get the lesson in. The sixth plague, 
verse 8 of chapter 9. And he uh, took handfuls of ashes from the furnace, Moses did, and scattered it into the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh, and it became like fine dust, and it created boils on man and beast. I don't know if you've ever had boils before. Um, you know, if you, we live in a fairly sanitary environment, you lose, usually don't get them unless you're just prone to infections. But growing up on a farm, we tended to get boils if you get a, a cut or a, a scratch and you didn't make sure it was clean properly, it could turn into a pocket of pus on your arm or your leg. Especially if you were under stress or didn't have enough vitamin C, it tends to fight that kind of thing off. Um, I remember having one on my wrist once that had five heads. A boil has a head in it a little nucleus of what started the infection. And when you have a group of them together, they call that a carbuncle. And I watched the nurse lance that one. I could describe it more, but I won't. What I will describe is one that a cow had. We had a cow with boils when I was a kid. Now this is, this is a story, um, a real one. My cousin and brother and I, we wanted to see the veterinary and deal with it. Now, we'd, we'd help squeeze the, the pus out of smaller boils. That was just de rigueur on a ranch. But this one, this one was beyond our, our uh, capabilities, so we called the veterinarian. It was rare that he came to our place because we did most of our own doctoring for the livestock. And so he said, well, rope her and throw her. So we roped her and, and pulled her down onto her side. And then he went down, and we're walking up there behind him. How are you going to take care of that? And he said, stand back, boys. This is going <laughs> to explode when I lance it. And he used a, basically the size of a hunting knife. And it was a stream of pus that was, had to be that big. I hope that doesn't bother you. We're not eating or anything. This is a sermon. It flew 15 feet in the air and 20 feet distance behind him, which is why he told us to stand back. We had moved around to the other side, so we knew the direction it was going to go. We were standing there watching the fountain. And when it was lanced and he got her all disinfected and everything, she healed up just fine. But just imagine if most all of your livestock has all kinds of boils on them, and the people do too. You know, you, you, then it, you think, that that's bad. It would have been bad, very bad. Livestock suffering, the people suffering, but not in the Israelites' camp. They were all fine. Not one of their livestock died in verse 6. Then, uh, that, well, that was in the, uh, the livestock disease. It was the plague didn't affect the Israelites either. The seventh plague was the hail. Now, when the hailstorm came, and there's, there, there are hail plagues that are coming in the end of the age and some of the end time prophecies it talks about supernatural hailstones. The way a hailstorm stone is formed, you have water droplets moving through different layers of air. Typically these are created by uh, updrafts which are normally triggered at the ground level by cliff faces or, or high steep slopes. Uh, we happened to live in, a ha lived in a hail belt where we grew up in South Dakota next to a river. There was a cliff, and it created hail for us, which wasn't so good every other year. But it, you'll get a droplet that will come down from a warm air mass through a cold air mass, and it will freeze into a particle of ice. And then it hits the updraft, and the updraft, if it's strong enough, will push it back up into the, the warmer air mass where the moisture is. It will put another layer of water on, and it will come down when it gets heavy enough and freeze that. And if the updraft is still strong enough, it goes up and down, up and down, up and down until we used to occasionally get hailstones that would be uh, half a dollar size in diameter. Now, that's dangerous. You don't want to be out in those. Uh, it's not deadly necessarily, but it could be. Uh, when they're driven by 50 mile an hour winds, you don't want to be in them at all. Now, we lost birds and pheasants and the livestock normally get under the trees and they'd be all right. But when it hailstones get bigger, then they kill livestock. Uh, we had a cousin of my father and my uncle who lived in Wyoming, and he went out of business, and he came and told us all about it. One bad thing after another happened. The last bad thing was the hailstorm. And we thought, well, you, we, we survived hailstorms. And then he showed us the picture. He had nine hailstones he picked up that filled a half bushel basket. Those were huge. They were bigger than softballs. They killed his cattle that were in barns, killed all the chickens that were in chicken houses. 
You know, it, was, it was localized, but his farm was right in the midst of it, and then put him out of business. You could easily see uh, what the, the Egyptians were then for, therefore facing. Fire, and it also, it was mingled with fire, I presume lightning, because normally hailstorms come with major lightning. It creates the strong winds, and, or is indicative of strong winds that create the updraft. So you had the hail, and then came the plagues of the locusts in chapter 10. Whatever was left, the hail would have taken down almost all the vegetation in Egypt, depending on how extensively God allowed the hail to fall. And, you know, he may have had pockets that didn't get it uh, to a certain degree within the land of Egypt. But it didn't matter because the locusts, which are the grasshoppers, ate all the rest of it. Now, we're not talking about our little grasshoppers. And in Ohio, I've never seen grasshoppers larger than an inch and a quarter. I study grasshoppers. <laughs> what else is there to do? Uh, <laughs> South Dakota, we had small ones, and we had larger ones, a couple inches or more. The biggest I ever saw was one that was three inches. That would be where they started in Egypt. The Egyptian or the Af North African locusts can get up to four to six inches long. Well, just a regular grasshopper, a small one, eats a lot of vegetation, a lot of leaf ter territory. When they get big, they get really seriously hungry, and they scarf vegetation down like crazy. When you have a whole massive plague of them coming in a storm of locusts that blacken the sky, which we had that happen in the 30s in parts of uh, the central, you know, central part of the country uh, here in America. During the dust storms, part of that was uh, not precipitated by, but it was certainly contributed to by locust plagues. And we had neighbors, my father and my uncle told me that uh, when they were small boys, they had a neighbor who raised his turkeys on grasshoppers because they had way too many grasshoppers, damaged the corn and uh, sugar beet crops. So he would take his little turkeys and he would herd them through fields he didn't charge anybody anything because at the end of the summer he had all these massively fat turkeys that had grown up on this high protein food. Uh, so there's, there are all kinds of things that can happen, but when you get a plague of them, it just wipes out all the vegetation. It's devastating. After the grasshoppers um, or the locusts came the darkness. About three days and three nights worth of thick darkness. You couldn't see through and you couldn't get a light to shine through. Maybe some of our high powered, super intense lights that we have today might have shined through, but lantern lights didn't shine through it very well. And, and that's got to be terrifying. That was, that was more of a shock plague than a, de, a destruction plague. And then in chapter 11, and we're ramping up, by the way, to get us back to where we're going, we're ramping up to the Passover, which is the original Passover that Christ's sacrifice is named for. We're looking at the background of the ultimate sacrifice of Christ. Because we'll, we'll get into that as we come to the Passover service and the Days of Unleavened Bread. Chapter 11, the death of the firstborn is announced. The great plague that God would bring upon the Egyptians, he would kill all the firstborn. Whatever livestock even that was left, if the cow or the sheep or the horse was the firstborn of its mother, it would die that night. And then any human being that had been the firstborn in his or her family would die. Every, not just children, but adults as well. You could have a mother and a father who happened to be the firstborn of the families they came from, and they would die, and their oldest child would die in the same house. There was not a house in Egypt that at least, there was not at least one death from the plague of the death of the firstborn. And I think, well, so what's the significance of that? And it's obvious. Jesus Christ was the firstborn son of God, and he died for our sins. So that we might live and be a part of the great family of God to come. So you see how these events at this time are foreshadowing and, and explanation and enlightening of the fulfillment that was to come much later. 
death of the firstborn is announced. Then in chapter 12, uh, we have several things occurring. Primarily, the Passover festival is announced, but with the Passover is the establishment or the reestablishment of the Hebrew calendar. This month, God is speaking in verse 2 uh, to Moses and presumably to and Aaron. Yes, and Aaron right there. They are going to be the leaders. This month shall be your beginning of months. It will be the first month of the year to you. So the sacred year begins in the spring. Speak to the congregation of the children of Israel on the 10th day of this month, the first month. Every man will take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father, a lamb for the household. And if the household's too small, well, then you get together to where you have two households or three households because you're going to consume that lamb through the night. You're going to roast it and eat it. Your lamb, in verse 5, must be uh, without blemish, perfect lamb, perfectly healthy lamb, not, a, not a one that had a broken leg and was kind of a cripple and you didn't want to have around anyway. No, this has to be a perfect lamb, without blemish, and a male of the first year. And you will take it from the sheep or the goats. I don't know, we, all, we normally think of it's got to be a lamb, and we hardly ever think of the, you know, the... Uh, uh, the sacrifice of a kid, which is a baby goat. But it could be a goat or a lamb, you know, sheep or goats. And you'll keep it until the 14th day. So you pick it on the 10th day. You pick it from the flock. This is the one we're going to use for the Passover this year, which means you separate it. Otherwise, they all look alike, right? And you put it in a pen, and you're going to keep it for four days. And at the end of the 14th, at the beginning of the 14th day, you're going to sacrifice that lamb. So you get about three and a half to four days that you'll have it separated. And you're like, what is the purpose of that? I could ask a survey here, and I think I'd probably be the only one to raise hand, uh, my hand. Anybody ever raised bucket calves or orphan lambs? Oh, Freeman, okay, we, we have a little club of us here that, that have done that. And you teach them, well, we didn't like feeding the, the bucket calves. We didn't have so many sheep. Our neighbor had the sheep, but we had calves. And that's where the mother doesn't own the calf for some reason, or she dies in childbirth, or if our milk cows calves. You know, we're going we're gonna to have their milk. Anyway, uh, we would teach them to drink, and we would feed them a milk replacer and raise them by hand. And they all became pets, every one of them. It's exactly what happened. In three days, you're going to bond with that little lamb. And then it's going to die. There's a little twinge there, isn't there? You know, sin hurts. Sin hurts, and that's just a secondary lesson that God wove into the into the plans here. Then it will. You'll take the blood of the lamb. You kill it at twilight, at sundown, but before it's dark. You uh, at the beginning of the fourteenth day of that first month, in verse six. Then you'll, in that night, then they would paint the blood on the doorposts and the lintels of the houses of the Israelites and the death angel would pass over those houses. But they had to do that, otherwise it wouldn't pass over them. Then they will cook the lamb along with the bitter herbs, which are savory vegetables, and you'll eat, you do not eat it raw, you know, nor in boiled in water. This is to be roasted, and you'll, you'll eat it all, and then whatever you don't eat is going to be burned with fire, uh, and you eat it in haste, down there in verse 11. You know, whatever isn't eaten has to be you know, burned up and turned to ashes before you're done. And I'll pass through the land of Egypt on that night in verse 12, and will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will uh, execute judgment, meaning he would knock over the idols. Uh, and the blood shall be assigned for you on the houses where you are, and the death angel would pass over. This will be an everlasting ordinance at the end of verse 14. Seven days you will eat unleavened bread. So we have Passover, now we have the festival of unleavened bread that's attached to it. On the first day in verse 16, and on the seventh day, you will have a holy convocation, a special meeting to worship and celebrate that day. And none of you will go outside the door, goes on to say, we're dropping all the way down to verse 22 now, until morning. During that, that, that first Passover, they stayed indoors. Otherwise, if they were a firstborn, they'd be dead. And then the, the plague came and landed on the Egyptians in the last uh, 29 to uh, 30 and right at the end of verse 30, there was not a house where there was not one dead. 
And then the Egyptians, in verse, 30, verse 31 and 33, the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, just like God promised Moses. You will leave in a high hand. You will go out wealthy. The Egyptians will want you to leave, and they will give you things. You worked for them for hundreds of years for free as slaves. It's going to be partial repayment for all that labor. And they thus, they plundered the Egyptians there at the end of verse 36. They just didn't have to really do serious plundering. They just brought it and gave it to them. Leave, leave, or we'll all be dead. And then they began their journey. And then we read it in verse 37, 600,000 men on foot besides children. Well, 600,000 men, 600,000 women, and then children. And they didn't have small families in those days. So you could easily have about 3 million people, maybe a bit more. And a mixed multitude on top of that. There were other slave peoples. There may well have been some Egyptians that said, we're getting out of this place. It's crazy here. We're going to follow you. You make more sense. Now, the sojourn in verse 40 of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. 430 years. And we'll think, well, where, when were the 430 years? Well, basically dates from about 1876 is one of the basic dates for when the family of Jacob came down to join Joseph in Egypt. They were leaving, therefore, in about 1446 or 1445 B.C. Then they would wander for 40 years, and as you were closing in between uh, 1400 and 1406, uh, B.C. is when they would actually cross over the Jordan River and begin the conquest of the Promised Land, to give you a perspective. David came 400 years after that. He became king about 1,000 B.C. Usually the date is 1010 B.C. Uh, was when King David became the king. So it gives you some depth perspective. It is a phenomenal story, but we have to realize this was the original Passover in history. And when Christ came and he died for our sins, he became, he took the place for real of what all those Passover lambs signified. When we understand the background, then when we go forward in another sermon and we look at the Passover sacrifice of Christ himself, it has greater historical depth and meaning and substance on how it affects us and how it has affected all kinds of other people. We have a lot to look forward to in this days of Passover and the days of unleavened bread soon to come upon us.